Well, we're playing once again um, the anniversary game here, 1791 to 1991. There was a very good example of that the other day. I don't know whether you saw in the newspapers that Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal uh, was making a speech for the Observer newspaper to celebrate 200 years since the publication of Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man. <laughs> it was the Tom Paine lecture sponsored by the Observer and one of the quotes in The Rights of Man, which was not used on that occasion, which I picked out here, in which Thomas Paine said, Monarchy is a silly, stupid thing, <laughs> a plaything for the rich and a menace for the poor. Now that's uh, the theme, actually, of The Rights of Man, common sense, crisis papers. Most of Thomas Paine's life was devoted to the destruction of monarchy. And it is part of what might be called the revolutionary necrophilia which runs through the ages. That is, that each age worships the revolutionaries of the past and loves revolutionaries, provided only that they are dead. And the longer that they are dead, the better for them. That is the usual state of affairs with people in our tradition that are heralded by the existing society. Now, what we're dealing with today is a, another notch up, if you like, in that process. You have revolutionary necrophilia. You also have a phenomenon called revolutionary amnesia. That is, in which people forget altogether what has happened in the past. The observer does not have a Toussaint Louverture lecture. The observer is celebrating its 200th anniversary, and when I rang up rather plaintively suggested that they might have an article on Toussaint Louverture on August the 14th, well, August the 18th, which is a Sunday, to celebrate the uprising in Saint-Domingue in 1791, which after all was rather appropriate since the Observer was started pretty well about that time, I was told that we were looking back too much into the past. <laughs> and such a thing was absolutely out of the question. I don't know whether you've been reading the Observer, but every single thing in the colour supplement over the last six months has been heralding what happened in 1791. In other words, they'll remember everything except perhaps the most important event of that year. More important even than the publication of the rights of man, I would argue. Perhaps more important than anything else in the whole history of the world. It's no great exaggeration to say that. Uh, the events that started in 1791 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in San Domingo in the West Indies. And to get us there, I've asked a few O-level questions. I know you're, this is the cream uh, of the uh, Marxist intelligentsia in this country, and therefore you've all got not only O-levels, but also A-levels, and therefore the questions will easily, answers will trip off your tongue uh, as, I make, as I suggest the questions. I ask the question, who abolished slavery? And in a great roar, the answer will come back, William Wilberforce abolished slavery. One of the most heroic and greatest feats in the history of Great Britain is that this grand old Christian gentleman and Tory MP from Hull uh, somehow <laughs> struggling himself from factory to factory, which he owned, <laughs> and uh, treating the workers there, well, like, like slaves, <laughs> somehow himself, by a prodigious effort and enormous amount of prayer, managed to abolish one of the great obscenities in the whole history of the human race. And he was assisted in that regard, and this also will be in your O-level syllabus, by the youngest, and, uh, uh, the youngest ever Tory Prime Minister, uh, William Pitt. The Tory Prime Minister of the day, together with Wilberforce, drew up the first abolition bill for getting rid of slavery themselves. That is the Tory MP plus his friend and mentor, William Wilberforce, uh, drew up a bill to abolish slavery in 1792. It never did get on the statute book, but the answer is quite simple, isn't it? William Wilberforce abolished slavery, uh, and uh, uh, he was helped by William Pitt, and therefore not only the great inventions and deeds of civilization have been, of course, created by grand bourgeois people, but also the great reforms of history have been carried out by grand bourgeois people. The changes, the end of exploitation, has been brought around by people like Wilberforce and Pitt. And now we come to get us to the destination where we want to start. We come to another set of questions with which the answer would be very, very familiar to you. Who discovered America? That's absolutely, everybody knows that, don't they? 
Christopher Columbus discovered America. I mean, it was annoying that there were about 600,000 people living there at the time uh, who had um, apparently discovered it before him, but there's no doubt that Christopher Columbus discovered America. That is, he discovered it for the Spanish Empire, with whom he represented. He was an explorer, and, in, and, and, and he represented the Spanish Empire. He also discovered, in fact, uh, the same year as he discovered America, or the year afterwards, I think, he discovered a paradise island, what he described as a paradise island, the closest thing to paradise on the, uh, on the face of the earth. He described it like that. And because it was so wonderful, he called it, naturally, Hispaniola, that is, something that's come out of Spain, because it must have, because it was so beautiful, it was plainly something to do with the Spanish Empire. <laughs> this was the largest island in what later became known as the West Indies. It's uh, the island itself of Hispaniola was about the size of Ireland, fairly substantial size, and uh, when Columbus discovered it again, there were about a million people living there in apparent reasonable peace and reasonable friendship with one another. They didn't fight each other very often or anything like that. They weren't trained in the advanced practices of white Christian civilization, and therefore on the whole they didn't fight each other. <laughs> And the Spanish Empire was so delighted with having got hold of this island which they thought might contain gold, matter of fact it hardly did contain any gold, but they thought it might, that they started in the most extraordinarily short period of time to exterminate the entire population. And I mean exterminate. There were a million people there in 1493 when the island was discovered. By 1520, certainly by 1550, there were no more than 50,000 of the million people there, simply because they'd been put to work in the most brutal fashion known to the Spanish Empire, which is perhaps the most brutal of all, although it's a close-run thing and we're not going to get worked to have, have an argument now as to which was the most brutal of the empires. At any rate, the entire indigenous population uh, of, the, of, the, of the country was destroyed, and the Spanish imperialists, some of whom had turned into colonists, were therefore faced with the awkward question of how they were to get the wealth out of a territory if there was no one to get it out for them. Now, the time our story starts, Hispaniola is no longer called Hispaniola. It's an island which is divided into two through the imperialist wars that have taken place in that part of the world, chiefly between the Empire of Spain and the Empire of France. The Empire of Spain owned the eastern half of the island, which was called Santa Domingo. The Empire of France owned the western half of the island, which was called Saint Domingue. Now, it was something to do with the the relative life that was left in the two imperialisms, if you like, that the Spanish part had been left to rot. There were 125,000 people there, cattle simply roaming about, pretty well nothing cultivated. But the French half, Saint-Domingue, uh, remember now that this island, just in case you're still floundering about, wondering where the hell we are, this island is now called Haiti. And this island, Haiti, is now among the five or ten poorest places on earth both in terms of the state of the people there and in terms of its production. Now, in terms of its production, the western half of San Domingo, San Domingue in 1789, just to take a year, a convenient year at which we might start, in 1789 was the richest place on earth. It, uh, it produced two-thirds of all the proceeds of the trade of, of France. France being perhaps the richest or the second richest country in the world, one of the biggest empires in the world, two-thirds of all its trade was provided by production from Saint-Domingue, something to do with mixture of climate, uh, made it an extremely cultivable place, and sugar, cotton, coffee, indigo, tobacco were produced in that part of the world more, in, 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 easier, and in greater, in greater numbers, in greater volume, than in any other, uh, uh, than any, other well, any, any other place on earth. Whole cities in France, Nantes, for instance, Bordeaux, places that you'll have visited on your holidays, were all dependent there, dependent almost entirely upon the trade which uh, came from Saint-Domingue. Now, this vast wealth was entirely dependent on one phenomenon, that is, the phenomenon of slavery. Now, I'm not going to go in it, into it at any length, because on this subject, really, we're not in great difference with the people who produce great series on television and so on. Nothing 
distinguishes us very much. Everybody regards slavery as an obscenity. Everybody. Horrible thing that happened. I just want to give one or two figures to demonstrate the size of it. Between 1500 and 1800, 300 years before this, this is just up to where this story starts, 30 million slaves were taken from the continent of Africa uh, to the West Indies and to the so-called New World in the United States of America. Now, 30 million, that sounds a lot anyway. If I tell you that the population of Britain at that time was the population was 10 million, then what I'm talking about is three times the population of Britain. That is equivalent to some, something like to 150 million people. An enormous percentage of the population of the whole continent of Africa were taken from relatively peaceful and friendly surroundings into a, a hell which it's almost impossible to describe. I mean, they were... You know about it. They were chained, put on the boats. They were the lucky ones that were the ones that died on the boats. They, they were uh, treated as dogs, worse than dogs, worse more than animals, and the slave trade uh, was, and certainly is accepted, as being something unimaginably horrible in terms of the exploitation and horror. Nevertheless, the wealth in Saint-Domingue, at the time that we're talking about, was entirely dependent upon this trade. There were in the island, this part of the island, 30,000 whites, who were mainly either overseers or part of the militia or the planters themselves, 40,000 mulattoes, that is people of what we would call today probably wrongly mixed race, people who had come from black, was a, a black mother usually and a white father, and 500,000 black slaves from Africa. That was the, the population, about 600,000 people uh, of, uh, of San Domingue at these times. Two, and and two-thirds of the slaves in 1789 that were actually in San Domingue had been born in Africa. There wasn't, you see, a second generation, much of a second generation or a third generation of slavery at that time, simply because there wasn't time, really, to have children or, and the slave drivers were not particularly interested in slaves that had children because it was a process which held up the business of labour which produced profit for them. 11% of the population of Saint-Domingue every year died. 11%. Now that, you may say, well, what's that figure mean? Well, it means that more people died in Saint-Domingue every year as a result of the very high death rate among the slave population than, for instance, died in Britain in the First World War. If you wanted to find a time when lots of people died in this country, you would immediately think of the First World War. Horrible massacre of young men that went on and on for four years. But many, much smaller percentage of the population died then than died now. Their food was not provided. It was in the rules that food should be provided for slaves, but on the whole, food wasn't provided uh, for slaves. They worked a seven-day week and an 18-hour day, uh, once they got to Saint-Domingue, in the fields, picking the cotton, uh, picking the coffee, and generally getting the production out of the fields, um, that they had in their spare time to cultivate their own little patches in order to make vegetables for them to eat. The crucial thing about them was that they were not entitled to any minds of their own, no thought. One of the most savage sentences was handed out to anybody who gave any education to any slave. Even religion was regarded as dangerous as far as the slaves were concerned. I mean, they were allowed to be baptized, mass baptisms. The Catholic Church were allowed in for a quick baptism, mass baptism, and then out again. That was the total amount of time they were allowed for religion. In case any nonsense about eyes of needles and people being made of one blood and all that kind of thing should get out in the business of people going to church. And the whole process, of course, was held together by sadism. There's no other word to describe how it operated. It was held together by violence of the most savage kind. The slightest sign of disobedience, the slightest sign of independent thought, the slightest talking, the slightest disobeying of any rules, any kind, was treated with the utmost savagery, which is detailed in some of the books that were written just before our story starts. Baron de Wimpfen, for instance, a great liberal gentleman from France, who went out to Saint-Domingue was rather shocked to be sitting next to a delightful and beautiful hostess who at one stage in the meal, because she was dissatisfied with the taste of some of the food, uh, ordered that the cook should be put in the oven with the next course. That was standard way in which the uh, hostesses behaved at that time to show off uh, to their friends from, uh, from, from colonial France. Now, of course, there were revolts, it's not surprising, 
There were outbreaks of individual violence, but these were put down with such ferocity that they were never again countenanced. And uh, the whole operation survived on this notion of what I'll call, for the purpose of this afternoon, the conquerable mind. That is, that the minds of slaves, the minds of these black people from Africa, were conquerable. That is, they were, they were to be conquered and conquerable all the way through. It wasn't only that there was savagery operated, it was also that they would never revolt. They could never revolt. It was not part of their makeup to do so. Uh, those who say that there are those who say that uh, slavery was going to end anyway at some stage or other. Do you know these people who call themselves Marxists who say, who become the great determiners of what happened two or three hundred years ago? They become, they decide well, what was going to happen. Oh, well, of course slavery was coming to an end anyway. My, not at all the case. Slavery in Saint-Domingue would have gone on and on and on. There was nothing particular to stop it. A great many people were benefiting enormously from it, and therefore it was likely to continue. One or two things happened which began to stop it, and the first thing that happened was the French Revolution of 1789. Now, when the revolution took place, France was controlled uh, by people who, who had a conscience. Uh, you, you know uh, people with a conscience, that is, people with, with some wealth, considerable wealth, but also a conscience. And there was a problem for them about slavery. Because many of the writings in the Enlightenment which led up to the French Revolution, of course, were de denouncing slavery in the most savage way. How dare, this is hostile to everything that can possibly be regarded as the human happiness, the universal human happiness of mankind. All those great writers denounced it, the Abbe Reynal, Condorcet, all, uh, Rousseau, all those writers denounced uh, uh, slavery in the most uh, um, uh, 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 uncompromising fashion. But the problem is that once they got office, these same people, uh, people from the enlightened people who'd come in, they realized that there was a conflict because most of their income, much of their wealth, came precisely from the trade with Saint-Domingue, which in turn, as I've described, depended entirely upon slavery. Therefore, there was this awful thing which you see all the time in bourgeois politicians. You can see sometimes a schizophrenic mind. Here's a man called Charles Lamert. This is the exception, for instance, of one of the people who came into office that was immediately after the French Revolution. I am one of the great proprietors of Saint-Domingo, but I declare to you, that were I to lose all I possess there, I would make the sacrifice rather than disown the principles which justice and humanity have consecrated. He said, I'm prepared to renounce. Actually, history doesn't reveal whether he personally did renounce. But the other people were more sophisticated about the problem. Where against slavery, it's vile, it's outrageous, it's uh, inhuman, it's barbarity between man and man. No question about it, we're against slavery, but what about our money? What about our wealth, our big houses, and so on? And therefore, what are we going to do about it? And uh, they made a compromise. You will know, have heard about compromises in politics. People always make it. The, our politics is the art of the possible. That's now Bevan, you know, not, uh, not somebody coming along from the right or anything. Either. Politics is the art of the possible. We have to make a compromise. We have to make a compromise. We have to make a compromise. We can't declare the slaves free in San Domingue because that'll cut off all our wealth. On the other hand, we can't do nothing about it because that will cut us off from all the ideas of the Enlightenment which led us into this situation which, to our great surprise, we're now in charge of the country. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a compromise. We had a compromise. And the compromise was a decree which said that any mulatto... Remember the figures, 20,000, 30,000 whites, 25,000 mulattoes, 500,000 black slaves. Any mulatto in Saint-Domingue whose mother and father were born in France should get French citizenship. <laughs> that amounted to about 0.8% of the mulattoes. Not of the population altogether, but 0.8% of the mulattoes. And that was the great compromise introduced by the first phase, if you like, the first bourgeois phase, or ultra-bourgeois phase, right-wing phase, of the, uh, of, the, of, the French, uh, of the French Revolution. Now, no one was satisfied with the compromise. It was rather like the poll tax. Everybody was against it. It annoyed the mulattoes. It annoyed, annoyed the slaves, naturally, because they got absolutely nothing out of it. But most of all, it annoyed the whites. Now, anyone should dare to suggest even that 0.8% of mulattoes should get French citizenship was uh, an outrageous situation. But the point about the decree 
is that it loosened the log jam, what appeared to be a log jam that existed in Saint-Domingue. In other words, the notion that the conquerable mind, the idea of half a million people forever and ever obeying their masters was suddenly challenged. Even in that tiny degree challenged, the fact that there was a debate going on in the French Assembly, the fact that the French revolutionaries were discussing what they were going to do about slavery, seeps into the minds of many of the people, the slaves that are operating in Saint-Domingue. And there takes place then, August the 14th, I hope you'll put a ring round it and see what you're doing on August the 14th and do something to celebrate the date. But August the 14th, 1791, uh, under a, a, immediately under a man called Buchmann, there is an uprising in one of the plantations in the north. And before the planters know what is happening, pretty well the whole of the north of the island is in conflagration. And I mean conflagration, because what happened, of course, the brutality which had led to uh, the, all those years of brutality in slavery led to the most brutal treatment, and you may say quite right too, the most brutal tra uh, treatment of, of, the, of the planters. They were hanged, the, uh, the uh, great houses were burnt, and then, of course, as the planters got themselves together, they went back and, fall, and, and, and engaged in equal savagery wherever they could get hold of anywhere. And in fact, in some places, even in the places which didn't rise up, slaves were hung and killed just because others elsewhere had uh, risen uh, in, in an uprising. Uh, the uprising of August 14 was different to any other, in, in ferocity, to any other uprising that had taken place. Um, but it was similar in this that there was no leadership of it. It was entirely spontaneous, moving from place to place, armies growing up under different people with different uh, ambitions, uh, squabbling with one another, the constant squabbling between uh, the generals. So first the slaves, through surprise, got the upper hand in the north, and then with the help, incidentally, uh, of uh, uh, guns from Jamaica, which was then under British control, uh, French the French immediately, immediately recognizing their common interest, sent over to British governor of Jamaica asking for guns to help them, managed to get much more disciplined force, managed to get their militia together and started to win against the slaves. What uh, happened then is that in, a, in, the, in the small and relatively contented plantation of Breeder, where the planters had broken the rules and started to educate a very small section of their slaves, uh, there was um, a, a coachman, son of a coachman, and the coachman was one that was always taught to read, uh, who was called Toussaint. He was called Toussaint because he was born on All Saints' Day. Slaves only had one name, and his was Toussaint. And in 1791, and this is for the benefit of all those youth worshippers who get increasingly to annoy me as, I, as the years go on, he was uh, 46 years old. At <laughs> that time... And at that time had taken part not in any protest whatsoever, not, not in any protest of any kind. He was one of the very few slaves who was able to read, and uh, he had time to think. He'd read the Abbe Reynal, who had uh, perhaps written the most savage condemnation of slavery um, uh, in Saint-Domingue. He'd read the works of Julius Caesar, which I suppose assisted him a bit when he came to think of fighting the French. Um, and he joined the marauding uh, rebel armies in the north, First as a medical auxiliary, as he knew a little bit about medicine, and increasingly as a leader and a negotiator. And within a matter of months, he was, had become, really by dint of the arguments with the squabbling generals, by the constant arguments that took place, chiefly verbal arguments in councils, I mean councils, not elected councils, but just great camp meetings, great country mountain meetings in which masses of people came and listened to the debate. He asserted his authority uh, over the other generals, and one or two of the other squabblers were put aside, and Toussaint became the spokesman uh, for the slave army. So what you had was uh, the slave army, uh, chiefly constituted in the north, a uh, militia assisted by troops which came from France to assist the planters, if you like. This is revolutionary France they're talking about, commissioners and the like, chiefly to assist the planters, uh, and uh, 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 the two, a standoff, if you like, since I understand it's the phrase that we have to use this year, a standoff between the slave army on one hand and the, uh, and the, uh, 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 the, the representatives of the planters on the other. Now, Toussaint's strategy was quite simple. His enemy was the colonial power, France, 
and therefore anything that would help him in his battle with the colonial power was to be used. And in particular, he was assisted at that, that time from the reviving imperialism in Spain. Because Spain thinking, oh, slave revolt on the western side of the island, maybe the slaves will knock out the French, then we can move in and knock out the slaves, and then we can have the whole of the island. So they started to give guns to Toussaint. And uh, uh, he held all the northern harbours, all the northern ports and harbours of Saint-Domingue for Spain, which owned the east, which uh, occupied the eastern half of the island. Anyway, there's also incidentally, and just interestingly, in case anyone thinks these things are always clear and obvious, there was in the, if you like, the slave mentality, the leadership of the slave mentality, a notion that there was something particularly wonderful about royalty. It's something that if you read about the Peasants' Revolt, actually finished off the Peasants' Revolt, the idea that somehow the king was all right, but that everybody else, all these courtiers, you often see it as much about when people criticizing the royal family today, the queen's all right, it's all those people hangers on, you know, and all those politicians I don't like, the queen's all right. This notion was quite strong in the, uh, 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 in the slave leadership. E even Toussaint felt like that a bit, and therefore their feeling was not particularly moved by the activities, the republican activities, of the, uh, uh, of the French Revolution. Insofar as they were simply Republican directed against the king, then that seemed to Toussaint to be uh, um, uh, uh, something that he didn't particularly... And, and he was impervious, therefore, to the seductive advances of the French commissioners, the Republican commissioners, which had gone out there, Son Thanax, the General Lavo, people like that, who were Republicans, and went originally put to put down the slave revolt began increasingly to say to Toussaint, and to say with increasing sincerity, it seemed, look, why are you enemies of France? France are on your side. Why are you accepting guns from Spain when all Spain want to do is to smash you down? And all through the year 1793, the standoff going through 1792, all through the year 1793, this argument, this debate about what the central strategy of the slave army should be, should it be with, against, continue against colonial and republican France, or should it seek to change its views in the light of what was happening in Europe? Well, the fact is that in 1794, the whole strategy changed. The strategy of supporting the Spaniards changed and came onto, onto the side of, of, of France. Now why? What's the explanation for that change in strategy? The first and the crucial explanation, by far the most important explanation, is what was going on in revolutionary France. It's the explanation which is, makes this story so very exciting for us today. It perhaps deals a little bit with the question, are white people always racialist? If that question is true, if, if the answer to that question is yes, white people are always racialist, then there's not much hope for us, is there? Not much advance. The whole world condemned all the time, I suppose, to a permanent race war. Are white people always racialist? One answer comes out of the shift in strategy of Toussaint and the slave army in 17, uh, 1794. And uh, the, the, the reason was this. The attitude of the, 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 the French Revolution, 1794, do you remember, was shifting. I mean, it reached its peak. It reached its peak in the first few months of 1794. It has moved. It's been a shifting revolution all the time. Those people that I talked about earlier that were actually the planters that had the plantations in Saint-Domingue, people of that kind were being pushed aside and in their place new, more rigorous revolutionaries uh, were being put in place and held in, held in, in place by, for the first time in, in history, or the first time in history certainly since London in the 1640s, the common people, so-called common people, the people underground, the people without property, the sans culotte beginning to come onto the historical stage. That was happening there. And what, one of the results of that is this, that the French Revolution, the language, if you like, of the revolutionaries had directed itself against what it called the aristocracy of wealth, or for that matter, the aristocracy of religion. It had directed itself against those two things. But also crucial to the whole of that thinking, so inspiring to us today, was the notion also of the aristocracy of the skin. Now in 1794, February, at the very peak uh, of the revolution, Saint-Domingue was asked to send three delegates to the French Convention. The French Convention, and I repeat it again, controlled by the Jacobins, by the Montaigne, by the left, if you like, was asked to send three delegates, and they sent three. A black man, a mulatto, and a white man came to represent Saint-Domingue at the convention. 
And the description there in the account from the convention gives us a clue as to why the strategy of the armies in San Domingue began to change. Cambulas rose. Since 1789, the aristocracy of birth and the aristocracy of religion have been destroyed. But the aristocracy of the skin still remains. That too is now at its last gasp and equality has been consecrated. A black man, a yellow man, are about to join this convention in the name of the free citizens of San Domingo. The three deputies of San Domingo enter the hall. The black face of Bellet and the yellow face of Mills excited long and repeated bursts of applause. La Croix of Eur et Loire followed. The assembly has been anxious to have within it some of those men of color who have suffered oppression for so many years. Today it has two of them. I demand that their introduction be marked by the president's uh, fraternal embrace. Next day, Bellet, the Negro, delivered a long and fiery oration, pledging the blacks to the cause of the revolution and asking the convention to declare slavery abolished. It was fitting that a Negro and an ex-slave should make the speech which introduced one of the most important legislative acts ever passed by any political assembly. No one spoke after Bellet. Instead, Levasseur of Sartre moved a motion. When drawing up the constitution of the French people, we paid no attention to the unhappy Negroes. Posterity will bear us a great reproach for that. Let us repair the wrong. Let us proclaim the liberty of the Negroes, Mr. President. Do not suffer the convention to dishonor itself by a discussion. The assembly rose in acclamation. The two deputies of color appeared on the tribune and embraced, while the applause rolled round the hall from members and visitors. Well, there was no discussion, and slavery was abolished on February the 3rd, 1794 by the French Convention. Now news travels slowly, especially from France to Saint-Domingue, when you are controlling a slave army which is out of touch with communications in the north. And therefore it took a long time. No one knows when the news of that act of the Convention arrived with Toussaint Louverture. But he probably heard it about May 1794. And on May the 14th, 1794, he declared a complete shift in all his strategy. He changed his allegiance from the uh, Spanish to the French, seized exactly the same harbors that he'd taken for the Spanish up in the north for the French, declared himself a revolutionary France and took a second name. He took the French name Louverture, the opening to liberty. The opening not only to liberty, but the opening to an alliance between revolutionary France, who have declared us free, revolutionary France, and revolutionary Saint-Domingue. The word Louverture has those two meanings. That's why he called himself Toussaint Louverture. And it's true, the truth is, that it was in the nick of time that he did change his strategy. Because the second reason why he was considering changing his strategy was what was going on in Britain. And here now we come back to our old friends William Wilberforce and William Pitt. Now, I told you that in 1792, Wilberforce and Pitt moved a motion that slavery should be abolished. And in April 1792, an amendment was moved by the supporters of the great British planters of Jamaica and places of that kind. The amendment is a familiar one, which we come across all the time in parliamentary politics that the bill should be passed in its entirety with the addition of one word, gradually. <laughs> in other words, that slavery should gradually be done away with. That's practical Fabian politics, isn't it, uh, which gets things done. Well, that was passed in April 1792, so actually they did have something there which said that they were for abolition of slavery, but then how long was gradually? How long was it to be? And one answer to that question was this that Britain had now declared war with France and had observed what was going on in Saint-Domingue. Namely, there was a slave revolt that wouldn't go away. In fact, it seemed to be gaining in strength all the time and it even had a leader and a negotiator who was capable of negotiating with French commissioners out there and it looked as though that uh, France were involved in a very serious situation. Now, here is the crucial point. Wilberforce and Pitt were 100% against slavery but the chief reason they were against slavery is that the main profits of slavery were going to the French. You see, there's two points, and you can imagine them waking up at night and worrying about it. One, 
the obscenity of all those black people being yoked and put into the galleys and being taken and killed on the way and being thrown into the sea and thousands of people dying in the sea and all that kind of thing. That's obscene. That would wake you up at night. But even worse, it would wake you up at night if somebody else was getting the profit from it. <laughs> and this is the key problem that it was in Saint-Domingue, it was French. It was by far the biggest place where any profits were coming from slavery. And the British were running the slave trade. Those were Christian British people, captains, singing, Oh God, our help in ages past, as they chuck the bodies into the sea. The British were actually providing the material, the human material, whereby the French were making extreme profits. Now that was the, that had the bitterness, the passion, if you like, the passion of a Christian factory owner in Hull. The feeling, you know, like the, I remember, do you remember the passion um, uh, about the, 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 the atrocities in Kuwait during the war? The passion, how passionately people got so worked up about the atrocities in Kuwait. Same bourgeois passion, switch on, passion, switch that one on, passion. <laughs> Why? Because the other thing that's been switched off is the oil. I switch off the oil, switch on the passion. <laughs> now, you see... exactly the same thing here, they would have gone on being in favour of slave trade for the rest of their lives if only the, their competitors had not been making profits from it and therefore the situation in Britain changed. The situation among the bourgeoisie, the rulers, the rulers of Britain changed and uh, um, uh, there were 17, uh, there was a war, there was a war, what, what happened was that the British expedition was sent to San Domingo to take San Domingo both from the slaves and from the French. It was the biggest expedition that had ever left British shores. You don't read about it in the history books. A much bigger expedition, by the way, than the expedition that went to the Peninsular War. You all have read the Peninsular War. Discuss. Discuss Sir Wellington's campaign <laughs> in the Peninsular War. Was it successful? Discuss his military tactics. Three hours. You remember, you've all dealt with that. What you haven't dealt with is, what about the thousands and thousands of people that were sent to San Domingo by the British in 1794 and fought against the slave army from 1794 to 1798 in one of the biggest wars at that time in the whole British had ever been engaged in. No one really knows anything about that, but I can tell you this, that during the period of that war, the Abolition Society, the great movement to get rid of, free, of slavery in this country, practically petered out. Grateful to Robin Blackburn's book, The Overthrow of Colonial Slavery, in that he has spelt for the first time, gone into this in great detail, and spelt out exactly what happened. There were two more attempts in 1795-1796 to get a bill through Parliament. Both of them were unsuccessful. Neither of them were enthusiastically supported by the Prime Minister. The Abolition Society, that is the Slave Abolition Society, met twice in the three years between 95 and 97. In 97 it didn't meet at all. And from 1792 to 1800, one million slaves were taken on British ships from Africa to the West Indies and the so-called New World. That's what happened in that period. All that enthusiasm and passion about slavery just dried up because for a moment, in a long moment, for four long years of warfare, it seemed the eyes of the British bourgeoisie gleamed with the prospect that they would get hold of the cotton and the indigo uh, and, uh, and the sugar and the coffee of Saint-Domingue and the slaves that made it profitable, that made it so profitable. And therefore, their attitude changed. And therefore, of course, for Toussaint can see, Jacobin France is freeing slaves, uh, but the British are coming to restore slavery, and that's one of the reasons why he changed, uh, he changed his, uh, his allegiance. 1794 to 1798 is the war with the British. In all military campaigning, you won't read of more extraordinary military exploits than were conducted by that slave army. They could move 40 miles a day to the British 10. I mean, they could move with supplies at a speed which would leave the British lumbering in the back. And this was the greatest expeditionary force ever sent. With all the history of British imperialism behind it, all the history of British militarism behind it, unable to deal at all with the slave army. And what's extraordinary about Toussaint himself is not only his vitality and his ability to command his army in these circumstances, but also his extraordinary humanity. He wrote to um, Brigadier General John White, very accurately named, Brigadier General John White, his attitude, who was in charge of the British forces. You have demeaned yourself in the eyes of this and future generations in allowing one of your commanders, the Coward de la Pointe, to issue this order which could not have been issued without your knowledge. No quarter for the brigands, take no prisoners. 
and that in spite of the fact that I have given instructions to my commanders to treat all prisoners with humanity. I am only a black man. I have not had the advantage of the fine education the officers of His Britannic Majesty are said to receive. But were I to be guilty of so infamous an act, I should feel I had sullied, sullied the honour of my country. Uh, that was too sad to Brigadier White. I mean, you shouldn't write to Brigadier White if you're a black man anyway, but to be able to write like that indicates the kind of man he was. And uh, on April the 14th, 1798, the British had had enough, and uh, Toussaint led a victorious march into the capital, Port-au-Prince. The British had lost 80,000 men in that expedition, 40,000 dead, and 40,000 wounded or laid low forever by disease. That is more than the total loss in the Peninsula War, and the British were driven out of Saint-Domingue, never to return. But again, and this story is only understood by understanding the constantly shifting background of the French Revolution. French Revolution has reached its peak, and the French Revolution is in decline. And as the French Revolution comes into decline, so all those people who had benefited from slavery now felt not uh, unashamed to talk about their benefits of slavery and now started to talk openly about the need to restore slavery in Saint-Domingue. And uh, they sent another commissioner, a different kind of commissioner to the ones that had been sent to treat with Toussaint uh, when the, uh, uh, the Montaigne was in charge of the convention. They sent now the directory, the people that uh, took, took on after the, the, the Robespierre and the others, the directory, the five reactionary people who took over sent another commissioner called Edouville who fomented war between the mulattoes and the blacks. The mulattoes, if you like, had always played the role, if you like, that, that the middle class play in the class battle. The weathercock that blows with the wind. Mulattoes as, are almost detectable when the revolution in France is at its peak and allied with the forces of the slave army, the mulattoes 100% with the slave army. As the thing begins to subside, the mulattoes, under very, very powerful and rigorous general called Rigo, a very, very fine general, broke off and under the influence of French bribery and French manipulation, started a war against Toussaint Louverture's black army, uh, which was perhaps of all this story, the most awful and fratricidal war which went on all the way to 1801, and it wasn't until uh, January 1801 that the mulatto army was finally defeated, and Toussaint, in order to celebrate his victory over the mulattoes, marches into the Spanish side of the island, quickly conquers the Spanish side of the island, and enters now a victorious army into Santo Domingo. So, the position at the start of 1801 is that he's beaten off the first counter-attack of the French Republic to his revolt. He has beaten, when I say he, I mean he and the slave army, the slave army have beaten the full might of the biggest expeditionary force ever to leave the British Empire. He has beaten the Spanish Empire. He has beaten the mulattoes bribed by the French and he has abolished slavery. Not a bad job for nine years, I think you'll agree. Uh, but, uh, and uh, for a very short time then, you have a period, 1801 to 1802, a short peace in which the whip is banned, hours are controlled, uh, nine hour day, the devastation of production, which of course has taken place in the period of the war, is very quickly starts to be made good. In fact, I'm against describing utopias, and it certainly wasn't a utopia, ridiculous to describe it as a utopia, nor could it conceivably have been described as a democracy. There were very few elections that took place anywhere at all. Toussaint Louverture certainly, as far as I know, was never elected in any capacity whatsoever. But it is extraordinary how just in the very short period of time, between 1801 and 1802, when he was left alone by the various imperialisms which he defeated, there was at that time a, something which completely different to anything that had taken place before in the mind of Napoleon that had to be stopped as soon as possible. Napoleon, this is a quotation from Ralph Korngold's book on citizens called Citizen Toussaint. Napoleon asked what colonial system had produced the best results. He was told the system prevailing before the revolution. Then, said Napoleon, the sooner we return to it, the better. And in much more determination than the directory, the consulate, the Napoleon, uh, 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 set about the business of restoring slavery in Saint-Domingue. He wrote to Decray, the Minister of Marine, who was putting together an expedition to leave to, for, for, for Saint-Domingue, everything must be prepared for the restoration of slavery. 
This is not only the opinion of the metropolis, but is also the view of England and other European powers. I am for the whites, he said, because I am white. I have no other reason. Well, he had plenty of other reasons, as a matter of fact, but he didn't want to explain them. But that kind of argument appealed very much to the enemies of Napoleon, who were then, at any rate in, in, in theory, the British. And you'll all have read in your, in your uh, examinations and history books, you'll have read about the Peace of Amiens. You know, there was a peace in the middle of the Napoleonic War. There was a peace 1881. First of October, uh, there was a peace uh, at Salle at Amiens. On the 14th of December, the same year, a French expedition sailed to restore slavery in Saint-Domingue. One of the greatest French expeditions that had ever left the shores of France, headed by General Duguay, General Humbert, who put, who actually tried to spark off the revolution in Ireland, General Boudet of the Nile, General Boy of the Nile, the hero of the Vendée, put down the peasants uprising in the Vendée. All these great generals of the revolution were in the expeditionary force that went to put uh, to restore slavery and to knock out the uh, the, uh, the, the, the the revolution, the uh, uprising uh, led by Toussaint Louverture. General Leclerc, Napoleon's own son-in-law, declared, who was put in charge, he was put in charge of the expedition, and you can't show greater faith in an expedition than putting your son-in-law in charge of it, Leclerc said this, all the niggers, when they see an army, will lay down their arms. And the orders to the army as to what was to happen when the niggers had laid down their arms were as follows. All women who had consorted with blacks were to be executed. All education and discussion among blacks to be ended. There was to be no truck with any talk of rights of the blacks who have spilled French blood. Now Toussaint Louverture, remember this, had declared himself a revolutionary France. He had seen himself as part of the French Revolution. He was, as he said himself he was, a black Jacobin. And he watches the Grace's huge expeditionary force standing on one of the peaks in the northern Saint-Domingue Saint watches this great expeditionary force coming to do what? And it's obvious that it's coming to restore slavery and therefore he has to realign once again. He has to think again about his strategy. And the last terrible chapter of this story is another dreadful bitter war between this expeditionary force and the slave army during the first six months of 1802. Uh, after February, March 1802, 5,000 of this great French force were in hospital and 5,000 were dead. You will have read, if you read about this at all, which you don't, but if anyone had read, I mean, you don't in, in, in ordinary bourgeois history, you don't read about it at all. But if you do, you will have read that the, the French army did very well, but it was um, laid low by yellow fever. You will read that this great force went there, they all got yellow fever, and then they all came back again. That's what you read. <laughs> What you won't read is that in battle after battle, just as the British had failed to cope with the fantastic power and force and energy of the slave army, so the French were unable to do so. And one of the reasons why the French were unable to do so is that they noticed that whenever they came up against a fortress or wherever they came up close against the slave army, they were greeted with the most wonderful renderings of precisely the songs which they were meant to be singing. <laughs> So they would come up to Crater Pierrot, the fort which was held by Dessalines for months and months in a massive siege of the French of the fort in the center of, in the center of Haiti there, in the center of Saint-Domingue, and they would come up and about to sing the Marseillaise when suddenly the most magnificent blast of the Marseillaise would hit them from inside the port. The Sa Ira, the great uh, songs of the French Revolution, would come back at them from people who say, well, that's our song. What are they singing? Oh, that's our song. What are they, what are they singing? Allons enfants de la patrie. Where are they enfants de la patrie? Why? How are these people who are not enfants there, the, the, the niggers, singing these things to us? It confused people. <laughs> it worried the ordinary soldiers that were sent out there. And what worried them, of course, much more than that was that the military tactics and the military competence and the ability to handle weapons and so on was much, uh, much, much greater than anything they'd ever uh, 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 encountered before. So, of course, they resorted, as all great armies do when they're beaten in the field, they resorted to treachery. And uh, uh, what they did was they called on Toussaint to a meeting to say, look, let's, let's, have a, let's discuss this. It's been a bit of a stake. Let's discuss this as a joint French, French people. Let's discuss it. So like a fool and advised not to do so by his advisers, 
Toussaint went for a meeting with General Brunet on June the 7th, 1802, and as he walked into the meeting, he was immediately surrounded, disarmed, and uh, his bodyguard killed, and uh, uh, he was imprisoned. Put on a ship to France and imprisoned in uh, a deep and dark dungeon in the Jura on the Swiss border. And of course the idea was, and you'll get this in all bourgeois mythology, is that all revolts are led by agitators. That agitators arise with great powers. Powers which are something to do with the devil. Satanic, <laughs> satanic powers which converge all in one person. And all you have to do is lop the head off the person, take the person away, and all those powers leave the masses. That's always constant, isn't it? There's a strike. Who's leading it? Who's? Find someone. Execute them. <laughs> and... Uh, and the strike will go away. Now this was the feeling about the slave revolt and they were right in a way that Toussaint Louverture was the most remarkable person but of course his, he was not the slave revolt. The slave revolt, the slogan of the slave revolt was liberty or death which was exactly the position they were in. They either got rid of slavery or they died and that was the strength of the slave revolt from the very first moment that it started to be organised. And therefore the slave revolt continued after the imprisonment of, uh, of Toussaint Louverture. It continued, as a matter of fact, with much greater ferocity. All that humanity which I described earlier deserts the generals that take over from Toussaint Louverture, General Christophe, General Dessalines, people of that kind. All those, these people then show the hu humanity, if you like, and why should they, after all, when they have behaved that way to the leader who did show humanity? And therefore, the French, by the end of 1802, were driven out of Saint-Domingue. And ever since then, Saint-Domingue, Haiti, for all the terrible things that imperialism had done to it, for all the unimaginable exploitation and poverty that exists there, ever since then, Haiti has been, Saint-Domingue, whatever you want to call it, has been an independent country and there has never been a slave in that island since that time. Now that is the position. That's just come back to those early questions that I asked. Slavery was abolished not by William Wilberforce. <laughs> he, he had opposed, uh, he, he, he'd opposed um, uh, 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 the, uh, the slave uprising. He opposed the sl slave uprising. He was opposed to the movement to get the British army out of Saint-Domingue because it was supporting slavery. Wilberforce was opposed to it. He hated radicals and revolutionaries of every kind. Wilberforce did. And in particular, he hated Toussaint Louverture, the man who represented in action all those passionate speeches which he'd made in the House of Commons was utterly detested. And therefore, the first lesson... The first and elementary lesson which flows up these 200 years is that slavery wasn't abolished by some bourgeois Tory MP, some bloody factory owner. It was abolished because the slaves emancipated themselves. I mean, Marx uses that word emancipate when he talks about the emancipation of labor in the famous declaration, uh, the first international. But the slaves actually did emancipate themselves. The emancipation, the end of slavery starts with the victory of Toussaint Louverture's army. It goes on and on and on, and it goes on for another several decades before the black, people, the black slaves of the South of America have to fight a civil war to get rid of slavery there. But the self-emancipation is the central lesson. And uh, uh, the second central lesson, so crucial to us, is that they won it, they emancipated themselves because they made common cause with a common people of revolutionary France. There are some books, not many. There's one in the left book club called Citizen Toussaint by Ralph Korngold, who is the biographer of Robespierre. That's a very good book indeed. There's a, a, a rather quaint little book, which you might find, by, by the, the Reverend John R. Deard, Doctor of Divinity, 1853, The Life of Toussaint Louverture. A rather nice little book. Not to uh, understand about the French Revolution, of course, but it is a, a nice little book. There's a book by um, Wenda Parkinson, called This Gilded African, which isn't a bad book, came out about ten years ago. And we've got this wonderful History of Slavery now by Robin Blackburn, which fills in some of the gaps that I've tried to fill in there. But a million miles, and Robin will not at all, if he's here, he won't, will forgive me at once for saying it, a million miles, the best book, by far the best book uh, about this question, is the one that is called The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James, the man responsible for getting Frank Worrell captain of the West Indies cricket team. LAUGHTER
I tried to think of something more important about him to say. I mean, he was a Trotskyist for many years, but he did actually achieve in West Indian cricket the rights of the blacks to control their old cricket. And anyone's interested in that, whatever you're interested, C.L.R. James is the most magnificent writer. And this book, which comes out in the late 30s, C.L.R. James from the Trotskyist tradition, writing a book about the mingling of the two revolutions. There it is, available. You can get it here. Anybody who hasn't read that really has to testify to the Almighty in some way or other. <laughs> now... Toussaint Louverture himself, he died of pneumonia in that prison in the Jura on the 14th, on the 4th of April, 1803, and he died alone and old, and nobody knows where he's buried. As far as I know, there's no plaque, there's no uh, burial ground, there's no tomb, there's no mausoleum, there's no mummification, and that point was a point which interested the young poet William Wordsworth in 1803, who was himself tremendously inspired by the French Revolution, but whose revolutionary enthusiasms were just on the turn in 1803, just beginning to turn to the hideous reaction in which it ended up in the later period of the century. And somebody came along and he said, you know, Toussaint Louverture is dead somewhere in Switzerland, we know not where, he's died and uh, he's not even buried somewhere. And Wordsworth wrote what I think is his greatest sonnet. Uh, it's one which you might not have learnt by heart at, <laughs> at, at school because uh, I'm afraid to say that there is no reference in it to daffodils. <laughs> Toussaint, the most unhappy man of men, whether the whistling rustic tend his plough within thy hearing or thy head be now pillowed in some deep dungeon's eyeless den, O miserable chieftain, where and when will thou find patience? Yet die not. Do thou wear rather in thy brow a cheerful brow. Though fallen thyself never to rise again, live and take comfort. Thou hast left behind powers that will work for thee. Air, earth and skies, there's not a breathing of the common wind that will forget thee. Thou hast great allies. Thy friends are exaltations agonies and love and man's unconquerable mind. <laughs>